Welcome to My Favorite Mystic, a podcast about the weird and wonderful world of mysticism. I'm AJ Langley, and today I'm joined by Sam Doubleman. He's finishing a PhD at the School of Theology at Boston University, entitled Mediated Mysticism, the Medieval Development of Mystica Theologia, and its reception by Martin Luther. Sam, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me, AJ. So today you're here to speak about Nicholas of Cusa. Yes. But before we get into him, tell us a little bit more about you. How did you get into the academic world of mysticism? Yeah, this is a very good question. I guess if I would explain my journey into the academic world of mysticism in a very bookish way. I got into mysticism through reading. So I grew up in an evangelical church in North Carolina. And one of my favorite authors when I was in my early 20s was a Presbyterian pastor named Eugene Peterson. And people who are evangelicals probably know who he is. He's the translator of the Message Bible. And he wrote a book called Take and Read, which was an annotated list of recommended readings. And so I loved his writings. And I would just go to bookstores and any book that was listed in this recommended reading list, I would just find and buy and read. And so he introduced me to my first mystics that I read and first writers of mysticism. So I started to read a lot of Eastern Orthodox writers. I read through the Philokalia, which is a collection of Eastern Orthodox spiritual texts, which has Maximus the Confessor in it and other things. Through Eugene Peterson, I also came across the Anglican theologian Charles Williams, who was a part of the Inklings, which C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien and Owen Barfield were a part of. And Charles Williams' writings, I think, his novels and his essays were what really introduced me to the weird and wonderful and strange world of mysticism and a kind of esoteric side of it. And so Charles Williams' book, The Descent of the Dove, is a short history of Christianity. And it starts off with this maxim where he says, this also is thou, neither is this thou. And so he has this statement as a summary of the way of negation and the way of affirmation. And so anytime you're thinking of the divine, Charles Williams was applying this logic. You have to say, this also is you, God, but this also is not you. And so as a young evangelical who is so used to just reading the Bible to think about God, this was very strange and very different that you would be affirming things of God and then saying, but this is not you. And so I think from reading Charles Williams and having that approach of affirmative and negative theology in my head, was my first foray into a kind of theology that I would call mystical because it was apophatic. And from Charles Williams, I got into pseudo Dionysius the Arapagite. And so my academic work has been largely around the reception of pseudo Dionysius treaties, the mystical theology, which also is all about affirmative and negative predication of the divine. Now, when you say young, please clarify for me that this does not mean six, seven, eight years old. Yes. So when I was reading Eugene Peterson, I was probably 23. Okay. See, that's much better and more appropriate. Because, of course, had you been nine years old at the time, then obviously you're some sort of mystical theology prodigy, which is a different conversation. But we also need to talk about the social ramifications of engaging with this stuff as a child. Yes, no, I was not nine when I was reading uh, Charles Williams. Uh, the, I would be terrified by his novels if I was reading them when I was nine. So, yeah. I love that this is how you were getting your book recommendations when you were in your early 20s, where some people might be just getting a master list of, I don't know, every book that was ever mentioned in Gilmore Girls and deciding they're going to read all of those. This is a very different system. Yes, a very different system. And when I went to seminary, I kind of just had this list in the back of my head. So anytime I needed to write a paper, I was also just checking off the list. I was like, oh, I'm going to write a paper for a patristic theology class. It was like, okay, what are you going to write your paper on? And I was just looking through the list of classics that Eugene Peterson recommended. And I was like, Dionysius the Arabic guy. I don't know who that is. So I'm going to write a paper on him. And so I did. Yeah. What a wonderful cheat sheet for when you need to come up with an idea for an article or a paper. Yes, you just steal them from recommended reading lists. It's not stealing, it's inspiration. We use them for ideas there. We research really thoroughly and cite, and it's perfectly legit. Yes, for sure. That was my early approach. And it was interesting for me to remember that. I'd forgotten that that was largely how I got into mysticism, because that was almost 13 years ago. That's really interesting. So working our way to the mystic of the day, was Nicholas of Cusa on this list, or did you come to him separately? <laughs> 
Nicholas of Cusa was not on this list, and that's uh, he should be, but you know, he wasn't on Eugene Peterson's list. He'd probably be on my list when I write my recommended reading list of books. So I came across Cusa because I was already steeped in this tradition of mystical theology and thinking about what God is and what God is not and the interplay between affirmation and negation, which is a weird space to be in as an evangelical. So I did a second master's degree at Boston University School of Theology, and I took a seminar on the modern German theologian Paul Tillich. And in his systematic theology, he references occasionally Nicholas of Cusa's on learned ignorance. And so I was like, learned ignorance? What in the world? <laughs> and so the way he was explaining Cusa's approach to learned ignorance, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, that was the first time I'd heard of Nicholas of Cusa. And that word stuck in my head, learned ignorance. And then the next semester, a seminar class was offered at Boston University on Nicholas of Cusa. And so I was interested in medieval theology. I was interested in apophaticism. And I'd heard of Nicholas of Cusa through Paul Tillich. So I took the class. And that was my first introduction to Nicholas of Cusa. It's a graduate seminar on largely around his theological writings. And so I got to know him a little bit better during that seminar with the professor Andrea Hollingsworth, who was at the time a new prof at BU who's no longer at Boston University. Do you remember your first impressions of Cusa? Yeah, I think my first impressions were a mixture of bewilderment because he was very hard for me to understand, but then also excitement because he was saying things and doing things with theology that were very exciting for me and different and, and confirmed a lot of the things I'd been thinking about how to approach God through this affirmation and negation that Dionysius was talking about. He uses a lot of math. He uses a lot of geometry. He talks about God in terms of an infinite line. So he's an early mathematician as well. So some of this stuff was really over my head as a young theology student. So uh, excited and a bit of bewilderment because he's hard to understand. But I think that was part of what captured me as well, because that he was difficult to understand was also um, one of the reasons why I kept reading him and trying to understand him. That is really interesting because, I mean, as avid listeners of the podcast may remember, on episode 28, I spoke to Sapastri Chakravarti about the mystic Kona, who was a mathematician but used mysticism as a way of explaining how she came to these predictions without having to talk about why she was so good at mathematics. And I definitely think there's something to be done there between math and mysticism, but that needs to be done by somebody else who is not me and is better with numbers. So speaking of things that are confusing, you found Nicholas Acusa confusing, but instead of dropping him immediately, you decided to stick with him and put the effort into understanding what he's talking about. Exactly. I mean, first of all, there's the pragmatic thing that I wanted to finish the class, but then, you know, why now, seven years later, am I still talking about Nicholas of Cusa? Exactly. It's not just about powering through in the first place, but why are you still studying Nicholas of Cusa? I think it's because of that class. It's because of how Nicholas of Cusa was a reader of the mystical tradition. And he's reading so many of the texts I'm interested in from the Middle Ages, including Pseudo Dionysius, including Augustine, including Eckhart, and many, many, many others. He's reading them and synthesizing them in a really speculative way. So he's a really helpful reader to read alongside with for these other people. So he helps me read. Like I wrote an article on Nicholas of Cusa's reading of Augustine. And so I was reading Augustine and reading Nicholas of Cusa reading Augustine and being like, how in the world are you reading Augustine in this way? Like as the, saying the same thing as Pseudo Dionysius. So he's been a companion for me as I've been reading other books to read with. And then secondarily, I have to give credit to the American Kusanist Society for keeping me interested in Kusa, because the paper I wrote for that class was on Nicholas of Kusa's reading of Augustine. And as it so happens, I emailed some people online trying to find other people who are working on this. And they recommended to me to contact Don Duclo, who was at the time organizing the panels for the Kalamazoo International Congress on Medieval Studies for the Kusana Society. And so the Kusana Society organized a panel with myself, Sean Hannon, and Wilhelmine Otten on the mystical legacy of Augustine. And the society was just so generous to me as a young scholar and took an interest in me. And it's one of the rare places I've experienced in the academy where as a young junior scholar, I felt included at the table and in all the conversations. And going forward, I wanted to keep hanging out with these people 
And so I had to keep talking about Nicholas of Cusa as well. And so I kept wanting to go to their conferences and hang out with them. And so that's my plug for the Kusana Society for keeping me interested in Nicholas of Cusa by the fact that they are amazing people to be around. It is so wonderful when that happens. I had the same thing happen to me with the Mystical Theology Network. I went to one of their conferences, met so many amazing scholars, and just decided that they are all now my best friends. And I don't want to work in any other field because they are the people that I want to be working with and collaborating with and doing amazing things with. So I think that if you want an area of study to flourish, then you need a network full of really wonderful people. And then there's just nowhere else any new scholar wants to be. Exactly. I'm happy to hear that you've had a similar experience. Who knows, maybe mystical theologians are, people say mystical, are very generous scholars and like to collaborate with each other. I don't know. I mean, based solely on the number of people who have been so incredibly generous with their time and willing to come on this podcast, I have to say absolutely 100% that is fact. Back to Kusa, though. We were talking about him and his contemporaries. Let's talk a little bit about when his contemporary was. What do we know about him? When was he from? What did he write? Is he an easily identifiable figure? How much do we know? Yes. So Kusanis is very easily identifiable. There are biographies. So 15th century, 1401 to 1464. And he goes by several names. Kusanis is the Latin phrase of his name. He was born Nicholas Cancer, or in German is Krebs which means crab. So that's his surname in the town of Kews, which is today Burncastle Kews. So Burncastle Kews is still a town today and you can go visit a hospital that Kusanis helped found at the end of his life that has his library there attached to the Burncastle Kews Kusanis Hospital. So little is known of his early life. What we do know of him picks up in 1416 with his education. And he enrolled at the University of Heidelberg to study the liberal arts generally. And then he entered the University of Padua in Italy and studied canon law, where he got his doctorate there in 1423. He may have taught at the University of Cologne shortly, but then thereafter, he did not pursue an academic career of teaching. He pursued a ecclesial career and a political career really within the church. So he was a young, aspiring canon lawyer who took advantage of his intelligence and his social networking and had a very successful career in the church. So he began his ecclesial political career working for the Archbishop of Trier. And eventually he was brought into the Council of Basel and he was assigned during the council to the Commission of the Matters of Faith, which was dealing with the Hussites. And he was involved in conversations with the Hussites, and he presented a plan to deal with the Bohemians that was not initially received for their communion, but was influential for the later settlement in 1436. So there's a lot of controversy over Kusanis's early career as a church politician during the Council of Basel, because initially he was a very advent conciliarist. So conciliarism is, at this time, the theory that the council, the general council has authority over the Pope. And so this was one theory of how you deal with all this mess of the multiple Popes and things that were going on. And Kusa early on was a voice for conciliarism. And he wrote a really important treatise on the topic. But then by the end of the Council of Basel, he'd switch sides and was a supporter of papalism and papal superiority. So one of the most controversial topics in Kusana scholarship is why. Why did Kusa switch sides? And even Kusa's contemporaries who were conciliarists, hated him for switching back to the papalist side and had all their theories of why he switched sides. And a lot of it had to do as for money, for a power grab, for this, so that. But his move helped his future career in the church. He eventually became a papal legate in Germany. He had a bishopric in Brixen and eventually became a cardinal in the church. And he was a papal vicar of Rome for Pius I. And so this is the side of Kusanis that is the church politician. We also had a really speculative turn where he started writing speculative treaties on the knowledge of God. And there's an event that Kusanis attributes this change to. And it was also related to his biography. So towards the end of the Council of Basel, Kusanis was commissioned as a papal delegate with a bunch of others to invite the Byzantine church to participate in a council of reunion with the Roman See. So he traveled to Constantinople with a bunch of other people and he convinced with others delegates 
the emperor, John VIII, the Greek patriarch, Joseph II, and hundreds of Byzantine officials to return with them on a voyage to Rome, to what would become the Council of Ferrara, Florence, a council of reunion between the Greeks and the Romans. And so when Cusanus was traveling back, he reportedly had this mystical experience, we could say. He didn't use those words. Okay, so what words does he use? I'll read what he says. He stated that, quote, what for so long I desired to attain by different paths of learning, but previously could not until returning by sea from Greece, when by what I believe was a celestial gift from the Father of Lights, from whom comes every perfect gift, I was led to embrace incomprehensibles incomprehensibly and learned ignorance by transcending those incorruptible truths that can be humanly known. And he goes on to explain further. He said he came across this way of doing theology through a gift from the Father of Lights, which is a reference to James. And that's where Kusana starts writing about the knowledge of God through what he calls learned ignorance. And that initial gift of grace, of revelation that allows the mystic to gain knowledge that they wouldn't be able to access any other way is so fundamental to a lot of mystical works because they tend to be structured around a journey towards a better understanding of something that is inherently ineffable. And this idea of unknowing definitely fits into that. So what does this actually mean for Kusa? Yes, I will try my best. So one way you can understand is learned ignorance is just a knowledge of what you don't know. So, you know, like Socrates said this, you know, a learned person is their understanding of what they don't know. So you have an understanding of the limits of your knowledge. And so on the one hand, Kusa is talking about that. So you approach God through this kind of intellectual humility that is, you know, God as the infinite behind all things is beyond my understanding. But then Kusa also adds something to this, I think. It's not just the knowledge of what you don't know. So it's kind of just, you know, intellectual humility. Because in that position, you could theoretically say, I don't know about this subject, but I can learn about it. But for Kusanis, God is a different thing altogether. Because you can't just say, I don't know about this subject when it comes to God, and I can learn about it later. With God, there's no arriving at that eureka moment where you're able to say, oh, I get it. You know, and I understand it. And now I can clearly explain it to you. It's so the method of doing theology then is the Kusanis develops is he tries to facilitate through various examples, this kind of understanding of God as beyond understanding. And so what that means is it doesn't mean that you can't know God. That's not what Kusanis is saying. It's not this radical agnosticism. He's not saying God is beyond knowing. He's saying that God is known through your understanding of your ignorance of God. So that God is beyond knowing. And so he kind of tries to approach theology from that. So it's a deep experiential understanding of the infinite depths of God that are beyond understanding through the categories that we usually use to know things. I mean, how possible is it realistically to fully comprehend the ineffable and infinite and all-encompassing when you only have a human brain and human senses in order to do it. It just seems like an impossible task from the beginning. Especially once you factor in that there are people that you've known your whole life that you can discover new things about at any moment of any day. I mean, it is kind of the height of hubris to think that you could fully know everything about anything. Now with that said, let's talk a little bit about the experiential that you were talking about. So is Kusa normally considered a mystic? Kusanis, you know, he's not usually approached as a mystic. He's more approached as a mystical theologian. But this is the one text that would he's talking about his experience, and he's attributing his method to this experience. There's a body of scholarship on this event, of course. And I think the trend right now is for people to, of course, you know, interpret this in terms of, you know, all the tropes and metaphors that Kusa is using about a sea voyage and other things to question, you know, its veracity. And like, did this really happen? And um, Interestingly, and this is not my research, there's new research by someone in the Kusana Society who's looking at the reports of other travelers, and at least one other traveler has noted that they saw a inexplicable light while they were on the sea voyage. So there may have been this natural phenomena that I think it's referred to as St. Elmo's fire, 
that people see at sea on board ship that Kusanas and others may have seen. And Kusanas, while meditating on this natural phenomena, may have at the same time had a revelation about this impossible possibility that is God and how to approach theology in, in terms of what he comes to see as learned ignorance. So I'm more convinced that something actually happened on board the ship because there were a lot of people on this sea voyage, other people's writings about the voyage. So how does he go about communicating this new way of learning and knowing about the divine? Yes. Yeah, so Kusanis does use the language of mystical theology to describe his method. And so interestingly, he doesn't do this in his first treatise on learned ignorance, although he's quoting Dionysius, but he um, receives attacks from a Heidelberg theologian named Johann Wenck, who writes against his writings on learned ignorance and says it obliterates the basic creature creator distinction and also the Trinity and all these other lists of things that he accused Kusanis of of heresy. And when Kusanis wrote back front and center, he labels his approach to theology as mystical theology and says, you know, unlearned people like you can never understand mystical theology, which is a trope from Dionysius. He says, hide this stuff. And so he does label this as mystical theology, interesting within the context of polemics. And so you asked the question of, is his goal in writing mystical theology understood as learned ignorance? Is it just knowledge as knowledge or relationship with God? There is no goal of just knowledge as knowledge. Like he's understanding it's the knowledge of God, which is an experiential relational knowledge. And so, but Kusanis, as he's understanding of relationship with God, it's not as, you know, I grew up as an, in an evangelical tradition. When I think of relationship with God, I'm talking to God as if I talk to my wife. You have this intimate relationship with God who's very personal and very much a person. And so you conceive of the Trinity as a communion of persons, eternal divine persons who are eternally in communion. And like what relationship with God looks like is you're invited into this triune fellowship of persons. But for Kusanis, he says really weird things about the Trinity. Okay, well, that's very intriguing and mysterious. What is it that he says? So in his first writing on De Doctor Ignorantia, Kusanis says, rather than naming God Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it is better to name God oneness, equality, and union. And so he says, the names Father, Son, and Holy Spirit signal these ideas, and the ideas are more important. So he's more interested in the ideas of oneness, equality, and union. And those titles are from Augustine for the Trinity. And further on in his writings, he says some things that I, where I'm getting at as strange things coming from an evangelical background. I'm like already like, oh, okay. So you're saying don't say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but oneness, equality, and union. I'm like, okay, I'm already a little uncomfortable. And then he says, okay, better than that, it's better to say this, it, and the same. So hawk, id, et, idem. Or he says the triune name that's even better than this is not other, not other, not other. So it's non aliud et non aliud atque non aliud. And I'm like, oh my word. So this phrase for him, non aliud, he writes a whole treatise on God as not other. So when you have a relationship with such a God, what does that mean? And so that's me riffing on your point on, is it just about knowledge or is it also relational? And so it is knowledge for Kusanis is knowledge of the not other who is God is always relational, but the question is, what does it mean to have a relationship with one who is fundamentally not non oliud not other, not other, not other? And I think that's probably very different from everyone else who has an other. The thing for me about not other is it just inherently means everything, because then it can't be other to itself, so it has to be all of the things at once. I can see why this is a really complicated concept, but also it is quite elegant. Exactly. So Kusanis has been accused of being a pantheist, a panentheist. And so this is the element of like, once he starts talking about God as such, and he says many other things that would make you think he's a, a pantheist, God seems to be all things. And Kusanis does say that, but then God is also God alone as a single unity. So non aliud has this ambiguous meaning in Latin between the negation, not other, and none other. So it's this weird thing where he's trying to combine the Aristotelian approach of knowing something through definition. 
and having as precise of a definition as possible. And then the platonic approach of having the simplest definition or name possible. So the meanings of these two terms, not other or none other, it's, you know, God is none other than God, but then also God is not other. And so it has the negation and the none other. And so it's, it's confusing, but he's, he's in the group where you're saying, you know, things through naming them. And, you know, we don't always do that, but that name non aliud I think has the dual ambiguous meaning of the negation, not other and none other. Like it's the, God is none other than God, but then God is not other, meaning God is a unified whole where there's no parts. It does seem, though, like this is going to result in a lot of contradictions. So so how does Nicholas of Cusa deal with the idea of contradictions? So yeah, I have to explain the coincidence of opposites. And the best place to look in Cusanus's writings for the coincidence of opposites, and this is my favorite treatise written by Cusanus, is On the Vision of God. So Cusanus wrote On the Vision of God to a Benedictine monastery of Tegernsey monks in Baravia. So he'd stayed with these monks and developed a close relationship with them and talked with them about mystical theology. And the abbot, Eindorfer, wrote him a letter asking him to clarify the proper role of affect and intellect in mystical theology. So this is a whole nother thing in Kusana studies in this time period. This is this raging debate between what's the role of affect and intellect in mystical theology. And Kusana writes a letter back explaining to them, pointing into some of his sermons where he's saying, knowing coincides with loving. So he's using this idea of coincidence. But then he writes a whole treatise to try to explain this idea to them. And this is where he develops most clearly his theory of the coincidence of opposites. And so with this treatise, he sent an all-seeing icon of God. So it's one of these pictures where wherever you're standing, it, it seems like it's looking at you, omnivoyant icon. And so he sends this picture and he gives them a practical exercise. And he says, I will lead you into the divine darkness of mystical theology through this practical exercise. And so he tells the monks to hang this icon up on the wall and to stand dispersed through a room and to contemplate the image and to see if it's looking directly at them. And then to walk around the room and see if it's still looking directly at them. And if they can't believe what they see, you know, the impossible possibility that this icon is still looking at them, they need to converse with their fellow monks and ask them, do you also see the icon looking directly at you? They will say yes. And so they believe the reports of their fellow monks. And Kusanis uses this as an exercise to talk about the coincidence of opposites and mystical theology. And so he understands mystical theology as what he calls the coincidence of opposites. And so he, in this treatise, he says that there's this wall blocking us from paradise, which is the law of non-contradiction. And you get brought up to this wall of non-contradiction where opposites, you know, are contradicting each other. Like, and you need to leap beyond the wall of reason and intellect towards where God lies beyond the coincidence of opposites. God is not the coincidence of opposites. God precedes the coincidence of opposites or is beyond the coincidence of opposites. And so he, in his theology, plays with opposites a lot and says that, you know, mystical theology is this mental vision in a an experience of God that is beyond the coincidence of opposites. Amazing. Can you share a bit of the actual text with us? Yes. This is in the middle of the treaties, and I'm going to read a little bit of the passage where he's explaining this leap behind the wall. And there's some language in here that I think is really interesting. I experience how necessary it is for me to enter into the cloud and admit the coincidence of opposites above all capacity of reason and to seek there the truth where impossibility confronts me. And above reason, above even every highest intellectual ascent, when I will have attained to that which is unknown to every intellect in which every intellect judges to be the most removed from truth, there you are, my God, who are absolute necessity. And the more that cloud of impossibility is recognized as obscure and impossible, the more truly the necessary shines forth and the less veiled it appears and draws near. Therefore, I thank you, my God, because you make clear to me that there is no other way of approaching you except that which to all humans, even to the most learned philosophers, seems wholly inaccessible and impossible. For you have shown me that you cannot be seen elsewhere than where impossibility confronts and obstructs me. 
O Lord, you who are the food of the mature have given me courage to do violence to myself, for impossibility coincides with necessity. And I have discovered that the place where you are found unveiled is girded about with the coincidence of contradictories. This is the wall of paradise, and it is there in paradise that you reside. The wall's gate is guarded by the highest spirit of reason, and unless it is overpowered, the way in will not lie open. Thus, it is on the other side of the coincidence of contradictories that you will be able to be seen and nowhere on this side. If, therefore, impossibility is necessity in your sight, O Lord, there is nothing which your sight does not see. I really like the idea of this wall made of logic and reason, because that's what the negation and naming of God and trying to understand the ineffable, that's what that's all been about, is trying to put God into a box so that you can understand the essence of the divine and then know it truly and you just can't. So it seems very fitting that you need to get over that wall. And that is based on faith rather than on logic and intellect. Yeah, exactly. But then Kusanis does, I think, admit as such and say, even all this attempts to think correctly of God with affirmation, with negation, with taking these opposites, you know, he's using impossibility, necessity, created, creator, He's saying, these are opposites and I'm using to think of you, God, but I have to admit that like, I reach a limit where I can't get past. And that's where for Kusanis, it's a supernatural movement that passed the wall. And in the third part of Unlearned Ignorance and On the Vision of God is where he treats Christ in faith. And so he does see this understanding of Jesus as the maximum and the minimum is the language he uses in on their ignorance coinciding in the finite and the infinite in Jesus as the Christ and faith being given to the inquirer to see these things. And that's the language he's using to see them and believe them in a way that supersedes and surpasses all the previous work of reason in the intellect to try to understand the principles of nature and, and who God is. And so his work is always driving towards faith in Jesus as the Christ. There's something I really enjoy about when a theologian or a mystic or someone who has spent their entire life in the church, studied extensively, been involved in the ecclesiastical political side, been so ingrained in this institution, then comes out and says, it's just faith. In the end, that's all that there is. Logic and reason can only get you so far, you can only think your way so close to God, and then you just have to jump. There's nothing more to it. Yes, and faith is a gift from God for Kusanas, and also, you know, that's the language he used of the revelation he received of learned ignorance, you know, the gift of the Father of Lights. And so he does understand his understanding of God as something that was given to him by grace, by God. And it's kind of a weird thing to see in Kusanas because he's working so hard through the categories he has to try to understand God. And one of the interesting things about him is he doesn't start his writings with the revelation of faith normally. You know, in this case, he's starting with the icon in this material image that's a possible impossibility and trying to think about it. And, and then eventually he uses the reason in the experiment with this icon to lead the monks to the knowledge of faith. It's always highly entertaining when a mystic uses so many words and so much energy and so much time to tell you that they can't explain something to you, that they go to all of this lengths just to say, sorry, this isn't knowable. So with that being said, for all the Kusanis people out there, so they don't get mad at me, I have to say one last thing about his naming God, because the last treatise Kusanis wrote in 1464 on the summit of contemplation, Kusanis has some autobiographical reflections where he says, and I'm paraphrasing here, I used to think that God had to be sought in darkness. And by that, he means, you know, what you were just saying, you know, in ignorance and learned ignorance and spending all this time saying what you can't understand. But in this last treatise, he says he's found the name for God that entails a clear vision of God. And he uses the language of posse ipsum possibility itself. And so it's a short treatise and it's at the end of his life, but a lot of Kusana scholars see a shift where at the end of his life, he's affirming a name for God of possibility of can, where 
he seems to be saying in a more affirmative way, this is where I've landed on what God is. And there's a debate with, did he arrive at some kind of clear knowledge of God as possibility itself? And he played with a a neologism that he made up called possessed. It's posse and est combined together in a previous treatise. And it's, um, you know, est is the word for is or being and posse is possibility. And he combined them together. And then in his last treatise, he's saying, ah, it's not hidden in darkness. Everyone should be able to see this. And so there's this question of like, wait a minute, did you just spend your whole life like saying, you know, learn in ignorance <laughs> and like, wait, convincing me as a young evangelical for one, that like, I can only know God through knowing what I don't know. And then at the very end, you're like, actually, it's clear God is possibility itself. And then does this also need to be negated? You know, God is not possibility itself. And so there's also this question of if Kusa would have kept writing, would he have been satisfied with this name for God? Or would he have kept trying on new names in new ways? And I'm of the inclination that because every other treatise he'd ever written, he was trying a new name and a new way of thinking. And he was always searching for God. And so I think, although this is speculation, that he would have kept thinking of new names to think of God through. And so he hadn't given up completely on a negative theology either. So. Yeah, I don't think we can ever assume that the last thing that a person wrote is the last thing that they would have written, given more time and opportunity. For sure. Just as the way that we end a podcast is not the way that we want to end every conversation. But in this case, we are coming to the end. And I have the one final question to ask you, which is, Sam, why is Nicholas of Cusa your favorite mystic? Cusanus, I think, is my favorite mystic because of his theory of learned ignorance. And so I think what we described earlier about a lot of the things in mysticism where they attribute an ineffable experience to God and God being fundamentally ineffable, and we just kind of leave it at that. One of the things I like about him is just how speculative his writings were of trying to develop an approach to theology based on reason and revelation for approaching God as ineffable. So he was attempting to F the ineffable or to name the unnameable or in a very systematic way that, as I said earlier, is confusing. But for me, as a young evangelical who was just used to sticking with the names of God that were given to me in scripture, you know, or through the tradition of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Kusanis was like a a shock to my system. And so he really messed with me. And at the end, I think he's made me a more open person to other conceptions of God. And not to mention Kusa also wrote about other religions in Islam. But so, yeah, it's for his theory of learned ignorance and the way he attempted to name the unnameable in his theology and do that in a way that was systematic. The systematic approach is phenomenal, even when the system is incredibly hard to understand. At least we know that there was one. (laughs) Yes, yes. Sam, thank you so much for joining me today and for telling me all about Nicholas of Cusa and learned ignorance. Thank you for having me. And thank you all for listening. You can follow us on Twitter at MyFaveMystic and join me next time when I speak to Pablo Acosta about Juana de la Cruz. 